If they were to raise interest rates to 4%, which they conceivably have the power to do, it would nuke our economy, to put it bluntly. Recently, the Fed just began raising interest rates again. Uh, we just saw a 0.25 rate increase, and they're promising 50-point raises uh, into the future, maybe four or five this year. Um, I'm going to hold up a chart here. If you look at this, this is the last time they cut, or the when they began cutting rates, this is the tech wreck of 2000. Then we have the financial crisis of 2008, and we were at at or near negative rates for many years. And then we started raising again for inflation fears and then the pandemic hit and we dropped back to zero. So this little blip at the other side is, uh, is what we're entering in right now. We're facing 40, 40 year inflation highs. Uh, to get today, I have with me Christopher Leonard, who is the author of Lords of Easy Money, which is a look inside the Powell Fed. And we're gonna talk about uh, how long they kept rates negative and um, what the likely impact of rising rates is going to be on the economy. Welcome, Chris. It's good to see you. Good to meet you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I have a little bit of a bio here. I'm just going to read. Uh, Christopher Leonard is a business reporter whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and uh, Bloomberg's Business Week. He's a New York Times bestselling author of The Meat Racket and Cokeland. Uh, Cokeland won the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award. I've never heard of that award, but <laughs> sounds good to me. Any book that for book nerds gets, like me. Yeah. Any book that gets some recognition is uh, is is good news for the author, correct? Correct. Yeah. All right. Welcome, Chris. Uh, let's Let's dive right right in. Um, first of all, I just want to ask you uh, what you wrote about the meat industry and also um, and Coke, the Coke family, obviously. Uh, what brought you to investigate uh, the Fed, uh, especially under the Powell, um, with Powell as the uh, the chairman? Yeah, thank you. Great question. So, as you can tell, I'm a business journalist, and I focused on writing about really powerful institutions. I feel like that's a journalist's job is to write about these concentrations of power in our economy and, and explain them to readers so people know how the world works. And so my first book was about the big meat companies. Uh, I was born and raised in the Midwest, worked most of my career in the Midwest, so the meat industry is really important to me. And then the next book, Coke Land, about the Koch brothers, the K-O-C-H brothers was a profile of this huge corporation and, and kind of a history of corporate America since 1967, basically. That's what Cokeland was. So it was really almost by accident uh, that I came across the Federal Reserve and, and I did it while reporting Cokeland. So one of the great benefits of being a reporter is you get to meet all kinds of people. And, and one of the people I met while reporting Cokeland was one of these very bright financial trader types. And, and this was back in 2016. And this guy, our first interview actually lasted 11 hours, uh, which was pretty darn long. Mm -hmm. And after about four and a half or five hours, he said, okay, whatever, forget Coke Industries. Could we talk about financial markets and what I'm seeing in the prices of assets? And this guy spent hours walking through for me what he was seeing in asset prices, which he said were really elevated, but also what the Federal Reserve was doing and what the Fed had been doing since about 2010, which was uh, really unprecedented and extraordinary levels of intervention in our economy that was creating a lot of, a lot of side effects, a lot of distortions, uh, a lot of changes in the marketplace. And, and the one thing this guy said that really stuck with me was that in the first 95 years of its existence, the Federal Reserve, the central bank, kind of steadily increased the, the base of original money or the monetary base or, or you know, those, those dollars that only the Fed can create out of thin air. The Fed increased our monetary base to about a trillion dollars 
between 1913 and 2008. Okay, so that's like a, a trillion dollars of money printing in a century. And then between 08 and 14, the Fed's balance sheet grows by $3.5 trillion. So another way to look at that is the Fed printed over 300 years worth of money in about four and a half years. Yeah, that's a step change. And then you couple that with the graph you just showed of holding short-term interest rates at zero for about seven years. And what you're looking at here is a, I think it's fair to say a truly unprecedented experiment in easy money that happened during the 2010s. And that's what started me getting obsessed about this and realizing, you know, I need to understand this better. I feel like a book should be written about this so people can better understand what the Fed has been doing and how it affects their lives. And so that's how the story started for me. Uh, you call it an unprecedented uh, experiment, unprecedented experiment in money printing. Um, maybe put that into context. Historically, uh, fiat currencies don't last very long, and they are um, they are very um, contagious uh, for politicians. Um, money printing and also uh, excessive. Um, budget packages like we've seen, uh, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, what is the, put it into context for like uh, the 20th century. Like we, I think it, we've, we've become way too accustomed to just saying, oh yeah, the Fed prints, fit, prints money, the treasury is, uh, is spending too much. Politicians are profligate. Um, but for a, much of the 20th century, there were, politicians who believed that part of their role was to um, constrain spending and, and even balance the budget. We're not even close to that anymore, and no one even talks about it. Uh, and perhaps that why, that's why you wrote the book, too, is just to get the story out there and, uh, and talk about it more. I know I've been writing about it for, um, for 20 years, and we published a documentary called IOUSA, um, which, which was shortlisted for an Academy Award, but we, we were unsuccessful at even getting anyone to take any interest in this story. So maybe just put it into context and then talk about your experience so far after the book has been published. So much to unpack there. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Um, gosh, we could talk for a long time about this. So your point about trying to penetrate the public conversation and get purchase for this topic is such an important point. It's been tough for me. I think it's tough for everybody who gets into this. There's a lot of reasons for that, but this is a super important topic. Then your previous point of like, nobody's talking about this. I really want to emphasize the change has been extremely dramatic since the great financial crash. The last decade of money policy in America, going from 2008 to, to, to today, and particularly from 2010 till today, it has been totally different from previous eras. It is, the Fed is doing things that would have been unimaginable 10 years ago. Uh, the whole story is different now. And so you're exactly right that we're in a different world. Uh, it's, it's, and not enough people are talking about it and appreciating it. And that's exactly why I wrote the book. So, okay, quickly, let's rewind. You're talking about monetary policy. Uh, you know, we created the Federal Reserve in 1913 because we needed a, a, a currency. Uh, you can't have a modern industrialized capitalist society without a, a stable currency. And we really had literally a wild west of currencies in the United States. Your, your listeners know all this stuff, but you know there were literally thousands of currencies in the US in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So we create the Fed to in turn create what we call the dollar. And the dollar is actually a Federal Reserve note. Now, what you, when you were talking, one point that really flashed into my brain is that when you create a currency, uh, you know, a medium to exchange value. One of the biggest challenges is imposing some kind of discipline upon that currency uh, so that you don't fall in. I mean, this is, the, this is the story of money politics going back to the beginning is that you can fall into the seduction of printing money 
to to create spending power, but it ultimately just all falls apart and you have inflation or hyperinflation. It's happened time and time again. So what you, you want to do is impose discipline on the money creation policy. We did that for a long time by hooking our currency to the gold and the gold standard. Um, I've taken a lot of heat for this. I argue that the gold standard was tough and unworkable and kind of crazy in its way. For better or for worse, whether you think gold standard's terrible or great, that we abandoned it in 1971. And then we try to replace the discipline of gold with the discipline of a, of a committee. And that's, that's the committee that runs the Federal Reserve, the Federal Open Markets Committee. Uh, we created the Fed as this very strange political beast that is kind of accountable to voters, but in many ways not accountable to voters. The FOMC is, you know, the members are appointed by the president, approved by the Senate, but then they serve these long terms and they never run for re-election publicly. And I think the idea here is, is for this committee to be able to have the discipline to make the hard choices necessary to maintain a healthy currency. And so that would be to, you know, uh, expand the money supply as the economy needs, but then tighten the money supply when there's too much easy money. And we're seeing the system overheat through reckless bank speculation or, or inflation. It's the job of the committee at the FOMC to sort of manage this process. And, and, and the Fed, you know, we can talk about it all, but, you know, over the decades, they did a more, a, a pretty stable job of managing the currency. But when I talk about an unprecedented level of experimentation, I really mean that. Uh, in 2008, 2009, the Fed response to the global financial crisis, Ben Bernanke, who was chairman of the Fed from 06 until, uh, I'm going to get the year wrong. I think he left in 14 or when Janet Yellen mean, took over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So Ben Bernanke pushes the Fed to be extremely aggressive, extremely experimental. And when I say unprecedented, I love that graph you show of short-term Fed funds rates. You know, the Fed funds rate had gotten low in the past. It had brushed up against the level of zero, but it always, the Fed always raised that interest rate again. But between 08 and 2016, the Fed kept that rate pinned at zero. You know, that's seven years. That had never happened before. While at the same time, the Fed is, is pumping this money into the banking system through quantitative easing, dramatically increasing the monetary base. So these experiments in easy money and money creation have been of a dramatically different level since 08 and 2010. Yeah, with the chart that I held up at the beginning, it shows that uh, under Greenspan, prior to Ben Bernanke coming into uh, the, the uh, chairman's uh, position, Greenspan was the first to kind of drop rates dramatically in uh, response to a financial crisis. Uh, Greenspan was the first one to drop r rates dramatically in, in response to a, uh, actually it was a, it was a stock market crisis in uh, tech stocks plummeting in the early 2000s. Um, and then that becomes sort of the weapon of choice anytime there's there's a disruption in the markets or the economy itself. Uh, we saw that most notably in 2008. But then so at, following uh, Greenspan, there's Bernanke, then there's Yellen, and now uh, Jerome Powell uh, effectively following the same policy of attacking any kind of disruption in the markets or the economy with lowering interest rates. Um, so that, that, that philosophy has led to what you call the, the, this great experimentation with, um, with low interest rates and excessive money printing. Can you take me inside the Powell Fed, just the, the one that's currently there, and explain two things. One, uh, their justification for keeping rates at, or, uh, ne at zero or negative uh, following um, the pandemic, and or how are they justifying uh, direct purchases in um, equities and or bonds uh, in the market. I've, uh, I've always been fascinated by the, the idea that they believe that they can prop up the markets 
with direct purchasing. That it's unprecedented for one, they've never done it before. And then secondly, they, they don't really, uh, in their press conferences and the minutes, they don't really discuss the, the inner workings of, of the way that they're actually purchasing and propping up the market, purchasing at equities and propping up the markets. Can you take me inside the Powell Fed and, and explain how all that works? Yeah, I think the most critical element about the Powell Fed is that Jay Powell, when he became chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, inherited a project from his predecessor, Janet Yellen, and, 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 and in a way, her predecessor, Ben Bernanke. Jay Powell inherited the, the process of trying to, quote, normalize monetary policy. In, in other words, the Fed in 2008, 2010, pushes down this very experimental path of keeping interest rates at zero and then critically doing quantitative easing, which is just pumping trillions of dollars into the banking system. And the entire time this is happening, it's acknowledged within the Fed, within the top policy committee, the FOMC, it's acknowledged that, you know, we can't keep doing this forever. We're creating uh, un- imbalances and distortions in the market. And so we have got to start raising interest rates above zero to a historically normal rate of even like three or 4%, while at the same time, we need to start withdrawing some of this high powered money from the Wall Street banking system. So what was fascinating to me is when you go back and look at the debates inside the Fed, they realized they needed to pull back these easy money policies. I mean, honestly, as early as 2010, they were talking about quote, normalizing, but then they do the opposite and they print more money and they keep rates at zero. And then by 2012, 2013, you just see this chorus of we've got to normalize, we've got to hike rates. Janet Yellen took over as chairwoman of the Fed and tried to start hiking rates, found it very difficult to do. And then Yellen's tenure, of course, was cut short by President Trump, who in so many other ways, you know, consistent with his behavior and so many other things, he, he just absolutely turned his back on what was sort of the normal way of doing things in Washington, didn't appoint Janet Yellen, didn't reappoint her, and he appoints Jay Powell. So Jay Powell walks onto the job in 2018 and, and inherits this, this process of trying to make things normal again, trying to raise interest rates to a level that's not just like normal, but even low by historical standards. He's trying to get rates back up to 3%. And at the same time, trying to withdraw some of this cash from from Wall Street put in through quantitative easing. Uh, That was one of the most fascinating episodes in history, uh, looking at what happened when the Fed really tried to normalize, so to speak, in a concentrated way in 2018. It caused the markets to short circuit and, and fall. And in December of 2018, we saw a scarily synchronized downturn in the prices of stocks, bonds, commodities, you know, these things that don't usually go down together were going down in unison in December 2018, which caused Jay Powell to uh, extinguish or stop the program of normalization. They called that the Powell pivot. He said right after that, he said in early 2019, uh, sorry, we didn't mean that we're done. We're not doing rate hikes and quantitative easing in this way anymore. Oh, um, you know, I, I don't want to be long winded, but if I could kind of talk about some of the dynamics behind that meltdown, it's, it's important. I mean, quantitative easing is just replicating one trade over and over again, which is, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York calls up a primary dealer like J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs and says, hey, I want to buy an asset from you. So the Fed will buy $8 billion worth of mortgage bonds, let's say, from J.P. Morgan by creating $8 billion new dollars in J.P. Morgan's reserve account at the Fed. And so when the Fed did that over and over and over, creating uh, north of $2 trillion new dollars inside the reserve accounts on Wall Street, all that money that the Fed was creating in a zero interest rate environment is is going out into the world trying to find an investment or a search for yield. 
And so you had all these dollars chasing these assets like commodities, like corporate debt, like corporate bonds, like leveraged loans, like tech stocks, like Facebook stock. And so then when the Fed tries to reverse, when it tries to hike rates, when it tries to pull the money back, you know, I describe it as Wall Street reacting rationally and saying, oh, well, okay, the Fed's tightening. So these investments we made in the world of 0% interest and trillions of dollars in QE, those investments don't make sense anymore. So we're going to pull out. And that creates the market volatility. And the Fed has never had the courage to allow that market volatility to really unfold to, so that it could, could tighten. So the story of the Powell Fed has been the story of a failure to normalize. That's how I would put it. And, and why aren't they, why didn't they do it? Uh, they are very scared of the market consequences of doing it. To what extent um, is the Fed like a lot of uh, government bureaucracies where if they want to change policy, it's like steering a oil tanker. It takes a lot of persuading and and moving a, a large number of people. To what extent is the Fed a bloated bureaucracy like, like a lot of the federal government? Well, to a very large extent, like to answer the question quickly. Um, and what's interesting to me is, is, is the leadership culture at the Fed and you know how it, how it operates now. And I guess some of the like biases and procedures that have sort of sunk in and hardened inside the Fed leadership team. Um, as a bureaucracy, uh, it, it's, you know, bloated is an interesting word. It's not like uh, it's built super sprawling infrastructure like the Social Security Administration or something like that. The they haven't built a sprawling infrastructure like the Social Security Administration. But the Fed has, uh, particularly over the last decade, only expanded its footprint. It has expanded its size within our economy by buying more and more assets. And it is, it's increased the form of its interventions. In other words, you know, back in 2008, it was an emergency procedure when the Federal Reserve went out and bought mortgage bonds for the first time in the heat of the crisis in 08, okay? The Fed bought mortgage bonds directly. That was kind of crazy. They had to actually hire an outside bank to do it for the Fed. But then that became incorporated into standard function. And now the Fed, since COVID, it's been buying uh, $120 billion worth of assets a month, including 40 billion of mortgage bonds. Now the Fed has, has been cutting that down this year, but it's it's like, the footprint keeps getting larger and the interventions keep getting deeper. And they only seem lately to be moving in that direction of buying more things, pumping more money into the economy. The other thing I'd say about the leadership at the Fed, it's, you know, it's always been dominated by financial types, whether that's bankers, uh, whether that's economists, of course. But since the late Greenspan era and accelerated under the Bernanke era, I think you really see a domination inside the leadership at the Fed. You see a domination by PhD economists using these economic models to justify their own policies. Uh, I, I just saw that time and time again um, of Ben Bernanke having a model or a theory in his head and being resistant to data or information that was, ran counter to it, that came from like, you know, leaders in the business community. I quote a few cases of that in the book. And, um, you know, these economic models are often wrong. Uh, you know, again, it's in the book in 2012 when the Fed did its largest round of quantitative easing in history. It, the, the, you know, doing that was based on these forecasts from the Fed's own economists, and the forecast turned out to be catastrophically wrong. The models weren't good. And uh, so I think that there's a dominance of, you know, PhD economists groupthink, frankly, if I'm being blunt, inside the leadership at the Fed.
part of the reason I'm asking about whether it's a bloated bureaucracy, I like the way you phrased it, that it, its footprint has you know, spread out through the markets, through the economy itself. Um, that's important because when you're talking about leadership of the Fed, we, we often just look at whoever is the chairman of the board. That's who speaks when they give press conferences. That's, uh, that's whose name all the quotes in the minutes are attributed to. Um, when, when we do that, that we, we know that, that that spokesperson is in charge of, uh, or at least it, uh, accountable for the policies that increase the, the Fed's footprint across the markets and across the economy, who, who, is, who is the Fed chairman accountable to? It seems like no one. I remember when, uh, when Greenspan was in power, they, most of the world just assumed he had more, more, uh, more power. I shouldn't say when he was in power. When he was the Fed chairman, people assumed he had more power than, than President Bush, just because he was, uh, he was creating or was the spokesperson for policy that, that controlled the markets. And that, that Greenspan Fed, as you have pointed out, um, mutated into the Bernanke Fed and Yellen and now Powell. Um, who are they accountable to? Even if you know you're talking about them using uh, uh, faulty models, which we've written about many times. Jim Rickards has been been talking about how their their uh, actually specifically pointing out how their models have been um, flawed. Who are they accountable to when when they make you know catastrophic mistakes, as you point out? Well, okay, let's let's answer answer that in a really concrete way. The Fed is run by the chairman who is, or chairwoman, uh, the chairperson of the board of governors. Um, so there's seven governors and, and then the chairperson over the governors. You know, the chairperson of the Fed, like Jay Powell, the current chairman, they're, they're, when their tenure expires, um, and I think it's a four-year period, that... Uh, the, the chairwoman or chairman has to be reappointed by the president. So you've got this moment in time every four years when the chairperson can either be kicked out of the chairperson job or reappointed. So that's kind of one area where they become accountable to the public indirectly through the actions of the president. But you know, then you've got the governors themselves who serve a much longer term. I, I believe it's 14 years is the term of a Fed governor. And when that term expires, they could be reappointed or fired. And then, you know, when a new governor is appointed, they have to be approved by a vote of the United States Senate. What I'm trying to get across here is there are these little nodes, these little moments where the leaders of the Fed are indirectly exposed to public accountability, but it's a very limited and indirect exposure. And, and so, um, you know, it's not unreasonable or inaccurate to say that in many ways, Gr Alan Greenspan was more powerful than George H.W. Bush when it came to economic affairs, okay? Alan Greenspan cannot invade Iraq. Okay, that's, you know, the president can do that. But Alan Greenspan or Bernanke, Yellen or Powell and the, the committee of 12 that makes these votes on the Fed, I mean, they can uh, tank the stock market and put the country into a recession uh, with a one vote. If they were to raise interest rates to 4%, which they conceivably have the power to do, it would nuke our economy, to put it bluntly. So even to take a much less like hyperbolic example, this committee has an extraordinary amount of power over, over economic affairs in America. But again, this was all designed on purpose. The idea was supposed to be that if these leaders at the Fed had some independence and if they were insulated from elections, that they could make long-term responsible choices, they could think long-term, they could do the hard thing uh, to manage the currency. Because sometimes you have to create short-term pain for long-term um, stability of the currency. No better example of that than when Paul Volcker 
hiked rates to 20% and plunged the economy into recession in the early 80s to, to whip inflation. We're in a similar situation now. We've, uh, we're at the highest uh, inflation rate in 40 years since uh, Volcker was in office when he had to um, when he had the hike rates. I actually interviewed Paul Volcker about that episode one time, and he said uh, it's a misunderstanding to state that he hiked rates. He had to the way he phrased it is he had to chase rates up. He had to chase the market up, what people were willing to pay uh, to get. Uh, government treasuries um, in order to fund the government. He had to actually be willing to pay higher and higher rates because um, people were bailing out so quickly. Um, and as you point out that that action, there's a lot of people that live their lives indebted. Um, when the rates go up, it crushes a lot of people. Farmers in particular back then um, had a really tough time uh, planning out future crops because they they weren't able to to get the funding that they needed from banks and that or at rates that were uh, sustainable. Um, we're in a similar situation now, and they're they're telegraphing that they're going to be raising rates in order to combat um, in, inflation uh, that's in the system, mostly because of all the government spending, but also another period of uh, extended. Uh, zero or negative rates. As they raise rates, we could be plunged into another recession. Some argue that we're already there. Even on the chart that I showed, even on the chart that I showed, it already has a little blip of a re recession just after a 0.25 uh, rate hike. Uh, my question, I'm just kind of stating the facts. And then my question is something like, if the Fed has that much policy, I mean, much control over rates and the tentacles in the market and, and, um, and the economy, and they can actually uh, raise rates and cause a recession, but at the same time, they're buying directly by depositing money in the bank. So it doesn't that represent a massive uh, transfer of wealth from one, you know, from the middle class to bankers and Wall Street? Uh, you know, brokers and traders. It seems like the the lower, the longer rates stay lower, uh, the more indebted the middle class becomes, and uh, the more wealthy, you know, people that are on the the first wave of money printing um, as inflation makes its way into the economy. No question about it. I mean, the subtitle of the book is how the Fed broke the American economy, which is a pretty darn contentious subtitle. I really stand by it. And one of one of the, the primary dysfunctions I'm trying to talk about in this book is how the Fed's easy money policies have stoked income inequality, which is a huge, huge issue in America right now. I mean, I talk to the folks who have benefited from the run-up in income inequality. And you know, these are the hedge fund private equity type people on Wall Street, and they recognize that our society cannot keep going down this path of just extraordinary financial gains with a very small group of people at the top while wage earners are treading water uh, and falling behind. And I'll explain in a second how, how the Fed's actions just like inarguably mechanically fed into that directly uh, and, and, and why the Fed is having such a hard time raising rates now. But the, you've just brought up so much great stuff about Volcker. I've got to talk about that in a second and, and how it plays into what we're seeing today. This is going to sound so presumptuous to say, but I don't agree with what Volcker said he did. <laughs> I, because I feel like that's sort of false humility. No, I shouldn't use the word false. He says he just chased rates up. His predecessor, Arthur Burns, did not chase rates up. Arthur Burns kept rates incredibly low for years, and it is seen as one of the biggest mistakes in the history of the Federal Reserve, because doing so, when Arthur Burns kept rates so low for so long, it created the great inflation of the 1970s. And Volcker had to come in and say, I'm hiking rates. This has been way overdue. We're adjusting upward in reality. And I, and I get the sense, it's so cool you got to interview him, by the way. I did not get to interview him. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think he's saying he, he was tracing rates upward and, and, and negotiating that rate upward to the natural point, but that was a choice to do so. 
he he levied a choice to do so as chairperson of the Fed. What's so interesting to me is the opposite rhetoric has applied under Bernanke, Yellen, and Powell, whereby they say, oh my goodness, we're just chasing rates to zero. The, <laughs> the, the, the natural rate, you know, the, the, this mythical, invisible uh, full employment rate wants <laughs> it wants rates to be at zero for seven years and it wants us to pump trillions of dollars into the bank through quantitative easing i i i don't give credence to that argument either they made a policy choice they made a policy choice for years uh to do what they did so where we are today is a direct consequence and a direct outgrowth of what's happened over the 10 years and if i could just make one point Paul Volcker said it himself when he hiked rates in the 80s that he was he was fighting or tackling or confronting actually two kinds of inflation. One was price inflation, which we're seeing today. Uh, the price of gasoline, cars, television sets, those prices are rising at double digits right now, about 8%. Or heck, I think it's almost 9% now, isn't it? It's yeah. Ballpark, ballpark 8 Um Price inflation is rising very quickly, but the other kind of inflation is asset price inflation that we talked about earlier. When you've got dollars chasing assets, they saw that in the 1970s, as you mentioned, a farmland is a great example of these assets that the prices swelled because of the easy money, and then the prices collapse when you withdraw the easy money. The Fed made a very conscious choice that they would just let asset inflation run away in double digits every year and not fight that. So that's what we saw under Greenspan, Bernanke, and Yellen. And, and easy money policies of stoked asset prices, again, year over year, double digit increases in some cases, fine. There have been people inside the Fed, like current chairperson Jay Powell, who argue, folks, you know, Jay Powell put it very directly and, and starkly. He said, we cannot let this asset inflation just continue unabated. It'll create a crash. He said that in 2012. And where we are today is that the Fed knows if it tightens, these asset prices will fall just like necessarily. And here's the real problem of where we are right now. Price inflation is raging and it's going to face the Fed, I'm sorry, it's going to force the Fed to hike rates and normalize to fight inflation and, and force the Fed to let those asset prices drop in a way the Fed hasn't been willing to do for years, or the Fed just allows this price inflation to continue and, and embed itself in the economic system. So that's why we're in such a dilemma right now in such a tight spot is, is because Jay Powell knows if he were to hike rates to three and a half percent, which is historically like normal, uh, and 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 draw down the Fed balance sheet, it's at not, the Fed balance sheet is at nine trillion. If, if Jay Powell is to draw it down to five trillion, which by the way is higher than it ever reached in the previous decade, uh, there'd be a total financial market collapse, complete collapse. So that's why they're having such a hard time figuring out uh, what approach to take, how quickly to hike rates, how quickly to draw that balance sheet down without uh, causing a massive downward readjustment in asset markets. They, this year, they've at least uh, admitted that there is inflation. Um, we've been tracking inflation uh, for a number of years. And they, in their minutes anyway, hadn't, hadn't admitted that there was any inflation at all. So that's a turn, turning point, at least in what they're willing to discuss uh, with the press and, and unveil what their, their thinking is. Uh, I, I'm just gonna ask this question because I think it, it just need, it, it's a detail that needs to be addressed, is um, to what extent, you hear this come out of politicians' mouth more than uh, people at the Fed, but. Uh, to what extent are the supply chain disruptions uh, caused by the pandemic and or the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, to what extent are those uh, causing inflation? My answer, my immediate answer was that inflation was already baked in. Um, 
but I think there's still some trepidation on the part of the Fed governors that uh, they're, especially supply chains and now uh, sanctions against Russian energy, um, energy companies and uh, you know gas and oil, that that is going to continue to have a, an inflationary impact even if they do raise rates. So huge question, big big important question, and I obviously don't have a satisfactory answer just as a reporter out here trying to figure out what's going on. It seems pretty obvious to me, and, and I think to you too, that the supply chain, what is it not even, it's not even appropriate to say supply chain crunch. I mean, the supply chain catastrophe of COVID was a real thing. We've never had to shut down a globally interconnected supply chain in a matter of weeks and then try to reopen it again in a matter of months. And that had a large inflationary effect. Um, the war in Ukraine has obviously had an extraordinarily large and acute effect on, on, on wheat and energy prices that we're going to see for a long time reverberate. These are, these are very real issues, of course. Um, but they are part of the story. Are they 90% of the reason for inflation or are they 40% of the reason for inflation? It's gonna take a lot of smart people some time to sort through what has happened to figure that out. What we can't deny is that these things are supply issues, supply of wheat and oil from the invasion of Ukraine, supply of goods in the case of like the Long Beach, uh, peer that was like backed up uh, from the COVID shutdown. That's supply. As you well know, we, the other side of the equation is demand. So we've, we've got the federal government stoking demand through huge cash stimulus to the population. And we've got the Fed stoking demand for assets to an unprecedented degree on Wall Street through uh, printing several trillion dollars in a matter of months inside the banking system, that that very strong demand is what collided with our supply chain to create the eight percent inflation that we're seeing. So the you know the dilemma for policymakers is, uh, you know, I'll tell you what the Fed wants to do more than anything is sit back, let rates stay where they are or maybe rise to one and a half percent and then watch as the supply chain stuff even itself out and inflation drops back down to three and a half percent that would just be the best thing that ever happened to the federal reserve because they could avoid hiking these rates and creating the necessary market uh, uh you know volatility but that that supposes that like this thing is entirely driven by these supply chains. And when you look back at the case study of the great inflation of the 1970s, there were supply chain disruptions back then. OPEC created the massive uh, you know, oil embargo, but monetary supply was a key driver of that inflation. And, you know, the monetarist type people are going to say we can't fight inflation without hiking rates. So, uh, yeah. Well, they've talked about raising rates uh, four or five times this year uh, in order to to slow down the inflation rate. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if that's going to be effective. When they when they came out with 0.25, there was a chorus of people that were like, "Too little, too late." Um, I, I, I just wonder if inflation, we, we, I've written this many times myself. Uh, I think it was also Volcker who said, look, when inflation gets, uh, gets started, it's very hard to stop. And that was sort of the preface to what, how he addressed it back in, in 1980. Um, I just wonder if it is too little too late and if, if four or five rate hikes, uh, uh, apart from being very difficult in the financial markets, I wonder if it's going to be fast enough to stop, uh, if like runaway inflation. And back in the '70s, they coined that phrase "stagflation." The economy falls apart, but prices still rise. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't, I guess I'm maybe just asking your opinion that is it is it too little, too late, and can they um, 
can they tame inflation before it's too late? Well, of course, it's unknowable to you and I and Jay Powell sitting here in late March 2022. Um, there is a very strong case to be made that it is far too little too late. Um, inflation is at 8%. Uh, I have the privilege of getting to interview all kinds of people all the time. You tell me, I have not interviewed a single person in the business world over the last year who thought inflation was transitory. Uh, when, when Jay Powell got up and was saying that inflation is transitory and it's going to go away, you know, people who actually run uh, trucking companies, manufacturing companies, they thought it was nuts. Uh, they, they, there was just no way. They, I mean, they were having to bake in higher costs and in, in wage increases already. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that most of the folks on the ground that I've talked to feel like inflation is enduring and, and strong. Now, could it start to ease? Of course it could. Like the economy is so complex, it could happen. But we're looking at high inflation that has without question lasted much, much longer than the Fed publicly said it thought this inflation would last. And so what is the Fed throwing against that challenge? It's throwing 0.25% interest rates against 8% inflation. Now let's assume the Fed pursues the, the aggressive path that, that many think they will assume of, of you know, multiple rate hikes through the year. The, the, high, uh, the high watermark they're talking about here for interest rates is like 2.7% in the year 2023, next year. 2.7% interest rates against 8% inflation is nowhere near what Volcker did. Now, Volcker had you tell me it was north of like 15% inflation. I mean, it was really intense back then. But there are a lot of people who are more, you know, uh, amenable or, you know, let, let, they're friendlier to the Fed than, than I've become in my reporting. And they say this is way too little too late. And, and that the idea that you're going to, you know, slow down inflation or break inflation through these modest low rate hikes uh, is wishful thinking. And so that's worrisome, you know? And again, the economic consequences of rapid rate hikes would be extraordinarily painful. And I don't in any way want to like understate how bad it would be if the Fed hiked rates to 4%. It would, it would be a rough, rough economic transition yeah. that would be, you know, sort of inflicted on a population that has been working longer and harder and earning less for it than than they have in many years so that's a pretty darn bad outcome but when you look at the math it seems pretty tough to see how these he, these interest rates are going to you know whip inflation as they said back in the 70s mm -hmm. uh The first mandate of the Fed is to protect the currency. So when we, when we talk about hiking rates, that's their first mandate. And that has kind of, especially in the last month and a half, that has dominated the conversation. But we've also seen mission creep in the, uh, the, Fed, uh, the Fed charter, if you will. Uh, it went from protecting the currency to protecting the currency and maximum employment. And then it, they tacked on um, propping up the markets. And then now they seem to be tacking on an additional uh, climate change initiative. Um, that, was, that was sort of the genesis of my idea to, or, or my question about a bureaucratic institution that's hard to, to change course because they keep tacking on these additional missions of the central bank when the primary mission is um, is protecting the nation's currency. Uh, when you were writing the book or researching the book, did you did you get a sense of the sort of political initiatives that that seem to be coming out? 
they don't they aren't coming out as much as they're as uh, talking about inflation right now. But for a while, when rates were at zero or negative, they seem to be lacking for uh, things to do. So they started tacking on other things. <laughs> It seems like mission creep at a very bizarre time in our history. Okay, this is such an important question. And to look at, here, here's my personal analysis. I actually think it's fair to say our democratically controlled institutions of government in the United States have been rendered dysfunctional. I mean, let's say you are an ardent conservative or you are an ardent liberal. I think if you really are honest, well, not that people wouldn't be honest, I think we can all agree our government, particularly at the federal level, isn't pursuing either path. It, it, it's sort of like in a state of stasis and dysfunction. Our, our, our democratic politics is defined by trench warfare to win an inch, team against team, and dysfunction. Okay. In that kind of environment, the country has been relying more and more on its institutions that are insulated from democracy. It, it relies on these institutions to get things done for the Supreme Court to moderate or mediate our policy disputes or the military to handle our foreign affairs. Or in the case of economic policy, you kind of rely on the central bank to do everything because the central bank can still do things. I mean, in, in the crash of 08, the Fed printed a trillion dollars before Congress was even out of bed in the morning to debate the TARP bailouts. And, and so the Fed can move quickly and print money. But my, my you know, I, I think the Fed, this is key. The Fed was not built to do this stuff. The Fed was not built to be a jobs program. It was not built to be the primary engine of economic growth in America. Go back to 1913. I believe you're exactly right. The Federal Reserve had a dual mandate in 1913, and it was to A, create and manage a stable currency, and B, to be the lender of last resort in the case of a bank panic, okay? Those are two hyper important jobs, very important, difficult jobs, but the, it was still a narrow band of responsibilities. Manage the currency and be the lender of last resort. The mission creep has been extraordinary. And, and, and I wrote an op-ed about this that I couldn't get published, but you talk about the dual mandate of 1978. Uh, that is so fascinating. The dual mandate was in this like jobs act and the language, the extraordinarily vague language that was passed in 78 said the Fed needs to pursue its policies to reach maximum employment, to, to keep that unemployment rate as low as it can be, while at the same time fighting inflation. I think that that is a fake mandate and not a real thing for the following reason. When it's most important, those two things are in conflict. Uh, to manage the currency, sometimes you need to rise, you need to create a rise in unemployment. And if you only just wanna create a high employment, you're gonna have a hard time managing that currency. Uh, Paul Volcker, upon you know taking the job immediately violated the dual mandate if you will by um hiking rates to 20 percent and pushing the unemployment rate to 10 percent. what he said was like well i'm thinking about the dual mandate over time this is what we need to do to achieve maximum employment over the long run is manage to fight inflation and so if that means that there's like this sliding scale of time and that's it, then that dual mandate isn't an actual real binding mandate it's in the eye of the fed chairperson so final i know i'm talking a lot but like that dual mandate i see it as more of a political tool uh used by people like ben bernanke to justify whatever they want to do honestly and when you see the you I, I have a news database search engine called nexus when you look at use of the term dual mandate, you see it spiked in the Bernanke era. I don't think that that's coincidental. Uh, he was using it to justify quantitative easing. Um, so, you know, the mission creep can't be overstated. Uh, I interviewed Janet Yellen in 2020 and her view of the Fed was so expansive 
it was shocking to me. She's like, yeah. the Fed has become the lender of last resort for the entire economy. So it's not just like it bails out banks as the lender of last resort in the case of banking panic. It's like it'll bail out Main Street stores in the case of a pandemic, the Main Street program. I mean, Fed unbound is sort of where we live now. And you see it in, in the types of programs it's implementing and the kinds of assets it's buying and the size of its balance sheet. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, it, it, it has expanded dramatically in its mission, but not in its core function, which is just to create new money. So all these things we're talking about are, are programs created through money printing. When you said you couldn't get the op-ed on the dual man mandate in the 70s published, uh, when you said uh, when you said that you couldn't get the uh, op-ed that you wrote on the dual mandate published, um, can you speculate on why people wouldn't publish it? It's a, it maybe a too contrarian of an idea. I, I find that myself when when we do these interviews and when we talk about. Uh, ideas or like uh, theories about how things are uh, evolving, that when it makes people uncomfortable, it's hard to get beyond readers of, uh, <laughs> of the Wigan sessions. So I think, I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that on multiple fronts. Some ideas are hard to push through, uh, particularly when they cut against the grain. Um, and that's okay. I think if you've got a contrarian idea you know, I was taught in college, you got to work twice as hard, I mean, to prove it, and you got to have evidence. Now, I think there's a lot of evidence for, for contrary views about the Fed, you know, why I couldn't get that op-ed published, I need to hasten to blame myself, maybe I didn't work hard enough, I didn't pitch it enough, <laughs> okay, so that's on me. Also, we're getting back to this point of trying to talk about this stuff publicly, it can seem so obscure, and, and I hate the word wonky, but it can seem so obscure and technical that only economists would care about, you know, the dual mandate at the Federal Reserve. I really do think that that's a huge barrier to getting these issues in front of the public is my business has sort of fallen down on the job, I think it's fair to say, in terms of making this stuff relatable and, and not writing about the Fed as if you're just writing for bond market traders who have a very sophisticated vocabulary, but writing about it in English for everybody else. And, and I, I just think that's a constant hurdle that needs to be jumped on these issues. And I wrote about media coverage of the Fed in the book. And the largest factor is that people just don't think about the Fed or talk about the Fed. Most of the media engagement around the Federal Reserve is non-engagement. Part of that's a problem, you know, with our landscape today, media-wise, but the Fed is also responsible because the leadership of the Fed from Greenspan on has made a concerted effort to make their policy sound as hyper-complicated as possible and to pull it out of the public sphere. I mean, back back when William Jennings Bryan ran for president in the early 1900s, they were talking about monetary policy on the campaign trail. It was retail politics. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold it was a monetary policy speech. And I really think we need to work hard to get this into the public arena as much as possible. And it's a hard job. Well, especially where the Fed wields as so much power as it does over the uh, over the economy, and you know, we were just talking about uh, transfer of wealth from the middle class upward, um, which has happened at at an unprecedented rate over the last uh, four or five years, and really accelerated under the uh, lockdowns in the pandemic. Uh, it's kind of shocking those figures. I'll have to dig them out when we publish this, but um, it's it's amazing. Um, and if you send me your op-ed, I'll publish it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it out there somehow. Okay. Um, so last question I wanted to ask you is a little bit uh, a little bit different. Um, 
you, you had speculated that the Fed will raise interest rates as much as, as, as sort of po politically tenable. Um, and you, you were suggesting that the Fed would like to end up at like 2.7 or something like that and just kind of wait until the supply chain issues have uh, worked themselves out. Uh, in the meantime, we would still have inflation at eight or whatever, eight or 10%, or maybe it drops to like 6%. We still have inflation. What asset bubbles do you see um, increasing? It looks like commodities are probably going to um, continue to rise. Uh, even gold prices have started to wake up from a multi-year slumber. Um, and then what should uh, individual investors who are paying attention to interest rates, not a lot do, a lot of uh, individual investors are in fact speculators and they're, they're not aware of it. Uh, but those that are, are paying attention to interest rates and uh, the inflation picture, what should they be doing? What, what kind of assets should they be looking into right now? Okay, uh, this is gonna be the most disappointing answer anyone oh, no. <laughs> has ever given on your show. I really do see my job as a reporter who tries to explain the mechanics of these systems to what you would call your average reader. Okay, a business traveler at a hotel for a conference. I hope they can read my book at night and then have a good understanding of how the Fed works and what it's done over the last decade. I, I am not sophisticated enough to tell your viewers or listeners how to respond in this economic environment because in 2020, in March, uh, it was clear that one of the most elevated asset bubbles was poised to collapse. And this, this was the asset bubble. Uh, I use that term. Um, others would dispute it. I use it all the time. Um, an asset bubble in collateralized loan obligations or CLOs, which are securitized leveraged loans. There were front page stories in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times called CLOs uh, a time bomb. Um, it, it looked as if it was all but guaranteed during the COVID crash that the value of collateralized loan obligations was gonna collapse. Well, guess what? If I had gone on your show and told your viewers to sell CLOs, it would have been an enormous mistake because just <laughs> weeks later, the Federal Reserve announced they would be directly purchasing corporate junk debt and directly purchasing pieces of CLOs, and the market recovered entirely. So that's enough to make me step back and realize I'm not the guy at the poker table who can figure out how these people are going to react to events. All I would say is that, you know, from a public interest standpoint, it's pretty obvious that these asset markets have been elevated dramatically by the Fed's actions. Tech stocks, corporate debt, leveraged loans, commercial mortgage-backed securities, um, just those, you know, risk assets. Risk assets have been elevated in price by the Fed's actions. And, and I mean, that's not, you know, the Fed knew that its, its actions would be doing that. But I, I just don't, feel comfortable at all telling people where to go because it's so hard to figure out where the system is going to move. I got to tell you, the Fed's balance sheet was a trillion dollars before the crash of 08, a little south of that. And then we have the crash of 08 and the Fed's balance sheet is 2 trillion. As your viewers know, the balance sheet kind of reflects the Fed's size of its intervention, its footprint in the economy. The Fed's balance sheet rises from 2 trillion to 4.5 trillion by 2014, and everybody's like, oh my God, a four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet? This is crazy. They draw it down a little bit into the threes. And then during COVID, the balance sheet jumps from somewhere in the three trillions to now nine trillion and growing. Okay. Is the Fed going to boost that to 25 trillion? Uh, who knows? Yeah, who is, knows? I mean, is the Fed going to keep it flat? at 9 trillion for five years? Like the, this is why I can't give any advice because I have no clue what they're gonna do. 
All right. Well, it's still worth reading the book because it, you do a really nice job of talking about the most recent history of, of the Fed and how we got here. So I recommend that our readers take a look at Lords of Easy Money and, uh, and pay attention to the subhead, how the Federal Reserve broke the American economy. It's a pretty strong, provocative statement uh, and worth a read. And uh, just looking at some of the people that have taken a look, uh, Mohammed El Arian, who's with, uh, with um, Warren Buffett, Bethany McLean, who interviewed me once after the collapse of um, in 2008, and, and we had called it, uh, we began calling the collapse of uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities in 2006. And so she called to do, she was doing a story on people that benefited from the collapse, but it, it was positioned as like, shame on you for benefiting from it. So um, she never put my name in the, uh, in the interview, but she, she read your book, so that's good. Uh, and James Grant, one of my favorites, he's uh, Grant's interest rate observer. He, um, we've known him for a long time. A lot of interesting writers and thinkers have read your book and I recommend that, uh, that our readers take a look as well. Thank, thank you, you Chris. Yeah. For, uh, yeah, thank you, Chris, for joining me. That's uh, it's been a good, interesting talk, and uh, I'll follow up with you for that op-ed. No All right, I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Okay, great.